pleasure and honor to have this conversation with Roddy Rodiger today. I met Roddy in 1986 when I began my graduate training at Purdue University. And I completed my PhD degree under Roddy's supervision at Rice University. Roddy received his undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University and his PhD from Yale. In 2004, Roddy also received an honorary degree from Purdue University. He's currently the James S. McDonnell Distinguished University Professor at Washington University in St. Louis. A truly remarkable feature of Roddy's research on human memory is that it hasn't just provided answers, it has shaped the questions for the field. He has published over 300 articles and chapters and authored or co-authored 11 books over the course of his career. He has served as editors for two major journals. Roddy's honors and awards are numerous. Uh, to just mention a few, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Howard Crosby Warren Medal from the Society of Experimental Psychologists, the Lifetime Achievement Award given by the Society of Experimental Psychology and Cognitive Science, and the John P. McGovern Award given by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. At APS, Roddy is also a recipient of the Williams, William James Fellow Lifetime Achievement Award and the APS Mentorship Award. Roddy is past president of APS, and he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was recently inducted as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So how did it all begin? Life take, takes many turns, Roddy, so start at the beginning. Uh, well, let me, um, let me start from more towards the end just briefly. Uh, one thing that happened, uh, one thing that I always try to tell audiences who don't know me is why my speech is a bit off. In 2007, I had tongue cancer and had surgery and radiation therapy, and I'm fine, but it changed my speech forever. So this is after a couple of years of speech therapy. So, but to back up now to the beginning of your question, uh, I grew up in a small town in Virginia, Danville, Virginia, uh, and it's a perfectly nice town, small mill town, tobacco town back in those days before those industries crashed. And um, mostly had a pretty happy childhood. The one huge event in my life, my mother died when I was five, and that was a shock, of course. And, but it's what actually started me wondering about how human memory works very consciously, because it was the 1950s. Nobody wanted to talk about death to a child. Uh, it was like she disappeared, and I would ask all, about, all kinds of questions about where is she, and wouldn't get much in the way of answers. Uh, and so trying to revive her memory to keep her alive, because nobody much wanted to talk about it, I discovered I could relive moments that I had had with her and keep them alive. And so I picked out about 10 things when I was, this is again, five years old, and uh, rehearsed those. Used what now would be called retrieval practice, although God knows I wouldn't have said that then. But I could just keep those things alive, and, uh, and I wondered, how does that work? How could, how could that be? And then it was much later, I discovered, well, there's actually a field that studies this. It always kind of stuck in the back of my mind. So that was intrigued me early on. Um, did it directly lead to where I am? No, not really, but it did get me intrigued. And then I grew up in this small town in, in Virginia, and uh, the rest of my childhood was you know, pretty uneventful after that. My father remarried uh, a stepmother that took me a little while to get adjusted to, because I was spoiled rotten by my aunt and my grandmother after my mother died. And then suddenly she came in and thought maybe I shouldn't be doing everything I was doing. And, and I also acquired two sisters then. So suddenly I went from being the oldest kid to the third oldest kid. So, uh, but we all blended together and became very, very close uh, over time, just like, and my, they're like my sisters. I've, they were there since I was seven, so. So that was the early beginnings of your family life. Uh, 
for education, what were the turning points around then or shortly after that became early formations of your leadership skills, really? Well, I went to, uh, as I say, I grew up in the small town in Virginia, and um, for whatever reason, this is a, a turning point in life that I can't really explain in retrospect, but uh, we got catalogs from different schools, uh, and one of them was a military school, Riverside Military Academy in Gainesville, Georgia. And I was 12 or 13 years old, and the catalog would come every year. Uh, and I started looking at it and thinking, well, what would it be like to go to military school? And they had all these wonderful pictures and people in uniforms and you know, marching around, and it looked like a little adventure. And so when I was 13 years old, I told my parents, uh, hey, I think I'd really like to do this. And the reason we were getting the catalogs is my father had gone there, and he said, no, probably you really don't. But uh, I was 13, I knew everything. So uh, I said, no, I really think I want to. He says, well, OK. Uh, if you go, you're not coming back home. You're going to finish there. If you make this decision, you're going to stick with it. And so he took me down there, but it was the middle of the summer. So the family went down, and I looked around looked just like the pictures. There weren't any students there for me to talk to. Uh, and so I made that decision to go to military school, which was a huge uh, turning point in life because I went from this pretty sheltered existence to suddenly being in a military environment. And after a week, I knew this was a cataclysmic mistake. <laughs> and so I called and said, I want to come home. And my father said, no, remember our agreement. Uh, and I said, yes, I do. And so anyway, I was there for four years, and um, it was an amazing experience. It's the four hardest years of my life. Doing anything in academia looks easy after that. Uh, being chair of a department, nothing. Uh, um, that uh, I, my senior year, I was the, uh, there was 600 boys there. And my senior year, I was the head cadet. Uh, so I was in charge of those 600, and I was the liaison between them and the administration and the faculty. And so that was really probably the most stressful leadership job I ever had in my life, by far. And I was 17 years old at that point. So, um, so it gave me, I almost went to West Point. I applied, got in, uh, decided at the last moment not to go, and I can't even tell you exactly why, but I hadn't applied anywhere else. So then I started applying places late, and I went to Eventually went to Washington Lee University, but a lot of my friends, that was 1965, I graduated. A lot of my friends went straight in the Army and went to Vietnam and died. So that would have been the alternative fate uh, uh, for a lot of those kids back then. So you got into West Point and didn't go there. That's really good for us. Uh, and. Uh, and then you also wanted to be a professional baseball player. Oh, when I was in high school, I, well, ever since I was seven or eight, I played baseball. And I loved baseball. And uh, the one thing at the school, uh, I could play all year round. I, I could play, you had to play a sport every day. I'd just spend two hours playing a sport, uh, or else you did calisthenics or something. So I played baseball, and then in the summers I would come home, and just as I'd get home, the league would be starting. So I literally played 12 months a year, uh, uh, hours a week. And, uh, and the coaches would tell me, I'm really good, maybe you have a chance. Uh, but I developed, after several years of playing hard, uh, what I would now think of as baseball metacognition. I realized, okay, you're really good for your team and your place, but every time I'd go play in some all-star team or go play some really good team, I'd realize I'm not very good. <laughs> Baseball, every sport has multiple levels, and yeah, I was good for my little small world, but in the bigger pool of baseball players, I was not that great. So I, uh, after playing a bit in college, I decided, no, nah, that's enough. It was taking too much time. So then let's talk about college. Talk about what it was like. You uh, worked with your undergraduate mentor for a long time, and that's quite unusual. Well, I went uh, so went to Washington Lee University, a small school in Virginia. Uh, at the time I went there, uh, two psychologists had left. The department was actually two people. It's now 10 or 12. It's much bigger. Uh, but 
they just hired a man named David Elms, who was, became my mentor, one of my mentors there. Uh, he was the third psychologist, and he studied human memory, and uh, I won these research awards so I could stay there in the summer and do research, and I did that with him, and I wound up having three publications from my undergraduate years. Uh, I mean, they were really his publications, but my name was on them. Um, and so uh, that was a very rewarding experience, uh, and especially being there in the summers where uh, we were testing uh, subjects, but there weren't many around. There was no summer school. It was a small place. I would test whoever I could find and go around the town trying to get people. Uh, but it was also a small town. Um, and so uh, I asked him, I felt like, well, I should be working. What, what should I do? And he suggested, well, it's fine with me if you just read. And so I would took that very seriously and just read and read and read those three summers. And there, uh, I had taken research methods and uh, did fine in it, but I thought, boy, I could really learn a lot more about this. So I actually set myself, every summer I read a different research methods textbook. And that was not exactly exciting, but boy, it really helped me in the long run to have that, done that. Uh, and read some statistics and uh, a big career changer was I read Roger Brown's Social Psychology book. It's just a wonderful book, the first edition. I never read the second edition. But I was also taking sociology and anthropology, and I decided uh, I wanted to go to graduate school. Um, and so I decided, well, what's, what's the blend of all these things? Well, I read Roger Brown's book, and so I decided, well, maybe I should go in social psychology. That seems really interesting. So. Um, I applied in social psychology to a number of grad schools. There's absolutely no reason anybody should have taken me. I had literally never taken a course in social psychology. There wasn't one. Uh, I just read this book, uh, but and um, I got in Yale uh, to do that, and I got in a couple of anthropology programs, but decided to go to Yale uh, for, for psych social psychology research. When I got there, I was talking to one of the professors, and he said, why did you come to Yale? Uh, and I said, um, well, I read this book by Roger Brown, uh, Social Psychology. And he says, oh, that's really more cognitive psychology that we study attitude change here at Yale. He barely covers it in that book. I said, oh. Uh, so, <laughs> oops. Uh, but uh, it was still a great place. I, I loved being at Yale. Uh, I took all the social psych courses, but then I moved into cognitive psychology. And you worked there with two of the biggest giants in memory research, Robert Crowder and Endel Toving. Well, I, my first semester there, I took a course from Robert Crowder, uh, who, who uh, became my mentor, my PhD advisor. Uh, he was a relatively new assistant professor. He'd only been there two or three years himself. And I took his course the first semester uh, and did well. And he, the, the program at that point, you came in, you didn't have a mentor. You came in and you floated around until you kind of hit it off with somebody. And my temporary mentor in social psychology was Dick Nisbet, famous social psychologist now, brand new assistant professor then. And he said, look, uh, be glad to talk to you. If you have any ideas about social psychology, please come see me. And so he's still waiting for me to come back. So, uh, but then Robert Crowder, Bob Crowder, when I was taking his course, he didn't have many students. He was recruiting me. I did well in his course. I'd already published a couple of papers on, uh, with Dave Helms on this. So he was actively recruiting me, and nobody else was. And I really hit it off with him. And then my first year there, uh, they interviewed Angel Solving. I didn't realize it was a job interview. I thought it was just a talk. And they hired him. Uh, so by my second year, uh, Enzo Tolving showed up, and I started taking courses from him. Uh, and I can still I have a vivid memory of the very first course I took from him. Uh, he assigned an essay every week. We had to write an essay. Uh, and I can even remember what the topic was, what I wrote. Uh, and he had the uh, unusual pedagogical technique that would probably not be permitted now. He decided he would. Uh, uh, come in and talk about our essays, and I thought, well, that's okay. So he held mine up as being particularly ludicrous, something nobody should ever say the very first class. 
Uh, and so we w that went on for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there were six of us in the class. Three people dropped after that, because uh, uh, he did it to everybody. It wasn't just me, but he started with me. And then I decided, this isn't going to happen to me again. I'm going to get this guy. And so uh, we, he loved to have battles, so we battled the whole semester. We would read things, and then he taught a couple of other courses like that. that uh, uh, it was very good intellectual exercise. It was not just, you, were, you had to think on your feet, and, or in your seat, as it were, uh, and you had to write every time. So, and you knew if you wrote something stupid, it would be called to your attention and everybody else's. So. It was uh, a great time at Yale. I loved Yale. I thought it was a great graduate program. Uh, it had no requirements, by the way. It just uh, you took statistics and anything else you wanted to take, and you for there was a preliminary examination, and what it was, it was kind of like sixth grade doing book reports. I had to read three books and write little reports on them, so <laughs> that was it, and then you did your dissertation. So uh, it was kind of sink or swim. You did it on your own. There weren't a whole lot of requirements, but uh, I loved it. It was just lots of freedom there, lots of great faculty. And from there, you uh, went to your first faculty position at Purdue University, yes. and that's when the cognitive revolution was in full swing. Well, it was what just, was that like? It was it was exciting. When I went to Yale, they just changed the name of the program in 1969 from human experimental psychology to cognitive psychology. And that course I took from Crowder, we read uh, Nicer's brand new book, Cognitive Psychology, which to my surprise, a lot of people haven't read. I've read it three or four times. Um, I thought it was just a great book. I learned from it. Um, and, um, and then Crowder eventually wrote his own textbook, which was really his notes from that course that he taught. Uh, so, um, then when I went to Purdue, there was no cognitive psychology course, so they asked me to develop one. And so my very first semester, in fact, every semester for many years at Purdue, I taught Introduction to Cognitive Psychology. I created the course. Uh, the guy who assigned us times, we didn't get to pick our times, but he assigned me 8 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I taught Cognitive Psychology at 8 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, so it was a great experience. I learned an awful lot by having to prepare the course, and I did a graduate version of that, too. So uh, books are emerging as a theme. So I'd be curious to know some of the big books that shaped your thinking. Well, I've mentioned Roger Brown's Social Psychology, Nicer's Cognitive Psychology. That, that really uh, was a defining moment, I think, because it kind of crystallized what was beginning to happen uh, in the field of human experimental psychology. Uh, much of it coming from England at that point. Uh, as friends of mine from England have told me, we, we, never, uh, we, we never had the age of behaviorism like you did in America. And so they got started earlier. Donald Broadbent, Chuck Cherry, all the people doing divided attention, split attention, uh, Broadbent's book, Perception and Communication, I thought was uh, a great book. read that in graduate school also. So um, from perception, attention, and then people studying what was then called verbal learning kind of made a transition to being people like, and not totally, but in large part to people like Enzo Tolving and Gordon Bauer and others to going from that one tradition to a more interesting tradition, I think, of, uh, of studying human memory, using many of the same techniques, but asking different questions. So I think that was a very formative time in the history of the field. Uh, and then things opened up. Um, there were papers by Bransford and Franks. Uh, Beth Loftus started studying the misinformation effect in the early 1970s. That was a huge development. Uh, and so lots of things were opening up in new directions that hadn't been there in the 60s. And uh, animal learning had been very dominant at Yale for many years, Clark Hall. Uh, and when I was there, Russ Gordon and Wagner were there. I took courses from uh, Alan Wagner. So I was steeped in the animal learning tradition too, which I think helped me an awful lot. The people studying animal learning and conditioning um, 
have thought through problems very carefully for very many years. And so that was a really good education to know that material, even though I never worked in that area. And then Neiser's book and Neiser's then book, Bartlett's book. Oh, okay. Book. Uh, I'd say Crowder's book uh, was very influential. I've read that several times. Uh, if we're talking about books, at least in my field, Angel Fulving's 1983 book, Elements of Episodic Memory. Uh, that was, um, I think, still is a source of a lot of inspiration. Um, I have my students still read it. Um, uh, I assign it every few years or teach a course where it's covered every few years. Um, I, I think uh, he had many ideas in there that are still bearing fruit today. So I guess those in psychology books would be the, the main ones that had an influence on me. So uh, when I came to work with you at Purdue, uh, you were studying implicit memory, and you were developing a processing approach as an alternative to the then dominant systems view of, uh, sort of different types of memory. So tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Well, that uh, came about really, uh, I, I spent several years on leave at the University of Toronto. Wendell Tolving left Yale, went back there. They wanted to create a kind of psychology course and they probably had 10 cognitive psychologists, but nobody wanted to teach the course. So Paul Kohlers was going on leave, a, a famous professor there. And uh, he asked me to come up and take Paul's place and teach cognitive psychology for the first time at the University of Toronto. So I went up and did that for two years. I taught uh, it was at Purdue. It was a semester course at Toronto. It lasted a year. So I had to kind of beef the thing up a bit. but. Um, but it was just terrific being at Toronto in those times. Uh, Gus Craig and Bob Lockhart were developing the levels of processing approach, and Bill Solving was working on ideas of encoding specificity. Um, there were graduate students just coming in. Dan Schachter was a grad student, first year grad student when I came. Uh, Eric Ike, uh, Janet Metcalf was there, uh, Gary Dell, and uh, lots of other people who went on to be really great. And so I was kind of almost their age. And so we kind of grew up together there. Uh, went back, I started going to Tulving's lab meetings. Mike Watkins was there. Uh, he and Tulving would fight every week. If uh, Tulving walked in and said, it's a nice day, Mike would say, no, it isn't. And we'd go off and running. Uh, and so it, it was a great time to be at Toronto. It was a hub of human memory research at that point. And I went back in 1981-82 on sabbatical from Purdue, and they were very kind letting me go up there uh, and come back. And so then I wrote a paper with Paul Kohlers that really changed that I'm getting around to implicit memory. That he showed in some of his measures, which are not standard memory measures, um, that you could get all kinds of uh, interactions, dissociations, we called them at the time, from different encoding manipulations and different test manipulations. And then as the, uh, what became priming implicit memory research was born, people were discovering those over and over and attributing them to different memory systems. But Kohler's was discovering them within practically, you know, just slight variations of the same task. So the, the idea was maybe there's a simpler interpretation so saying every time you find a dissociation, it's a new memory system, maybe there's an easier, uh, uh, a uh, more processing approach, kind of influenced by Craig and Lockhart again, although Kohler's wouldn't have said that, uh, a processing approach to doing this. Um, and so that was where that came from. And that led to a whole series of research that were done by uh, you, Teresa Blackson, Kavita Srinivas, other people who are working with me in that that era. Uh, so the Kohler's and Rodiger paper, um, I still get students to read that in my graduate memory course. Good. So it's been very fun. <laughs> <laughs> so as also the paper on metaphors. Oh. Yeah, I wrote a paper called um, Metaphors of Memory, pointing out that most of our theory, theories of memory are variations on a theme, and it's a theme that's embedded in our common language. We think of the mind as kind of a storehouse, and the, we speak of storing things and searching for them. And then even the, the, the terms we use for thinking are terms of looking for things in a visual space. We speak of having 
and insight or having a bright idea. So it's all these kind of, a big space, and then we search in that space, uh, we have a viewpoint, we have a perspective, all these things that you're looking in your mind space. So that paper got rejected by any number of journals before Bob Crowder was editor of Memory and Cognition. He took pity on me and published the paper after it was rejected by uh, Psych Bulletin, American Psychologist, maybe somebody somewhere else. Um, but anyway, it finally came out. Persistence in public <laughs> publishing. Well, you've got to be persistent, yeah. Yes. Especially for a paper like that that was kind of offbeat. But it, it, it has become a classic has since it? then. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So when I worked with you at Rice uh, University in the late 1980s, you seemed very happy there. Uh, but yeah, you I later loved moved. Rice. Yeah, I, I loved Rice. Um, I thought I'd probably stay there forever. I had good friends there. Uh, but then an opportunity came along, uh, I was called by uh, Mark Rakel, actually was chair of the search committee, the neuroimager at Washington University, and they were looking for a department chair, and they said, look, no commitment, just come up and have a visit. So a colloquium, it was the middle of the summer, so it was kind of an odd colloquium time. So I came up and had a visit. Uh, and spent a few hours talking to the dean there, uh, Ed Macias, who uh, uh, I, we just hit it off uh, very well. And so they were talking, so I loved Rice. Rice had about 15 faculty, Washington University had about 15 faculty, but they were building a new building, they were planning to grow, they were planning to really transform their department and they had all the support, and the dean had the support. I met with the chancellor. He was very supportive. He was a new chancellor, he's still there uh, now, which is unusual. But um, anyway, uh, I, uh, they built a new building. They were planning to greatly increase the number. I'd never been department chair of anything, so they were taking a chance on me. Um, and I was but you also, had been to military school. Oh, I'd been to, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, that doesn't too much matter when you're trying to recruit faculty. Anyway, we went there, I went there, and they had planned that it would be built in behavioral neuroscience, and I had to change their mind and said, look, uh, you've got, you know, this is where brain imaging of cognition started. Uh, Peterson, Rakel, uh, Fox, uh, Posner was there for a while. Uh, I said, you really should build on this. They started with PET, and then they were, went to fMRI about the time I got there, I'm still doing some PET. And so I managed to convince them that what we should do is, we built in everything, all of the areas, but disproportionately in cognitive neuroscience. So we hired seven or eight people who were doing brain imaging one way or the other. And um, so we had a psychologist, but we still do. I think we have seven or eight people there who either do either mostly neuroimaging or uh, half behavioral, half neuroimaging. Uh, so uh, we built in that area, and uh, that I thought was very successful. It's one of the best departments now, thanks to you. Well, I haven't been chair in many years. Deanna Barch is chair and doing a fine job. So um, your most cited paper is uh, Rodiger and McDermott, 1995. Uh, on creating false memories. Until that point, you hadn't published anything on false memory um, or even related topics. Right. So that was a big turn. How did that come about? Completely by accident. Most of the, like I go work with Paul Kohler's and that changes what I do. Uh, that uh, I've told the story in print. Enzo Tolving came and gave a colloquium. He's always involved somehow in my life. Still is, actually. We just talked last week. Uh, and um, he gave a colloquium, and it was about novelty in the brain. It had nothing to do with it. And I was the MC, so I was sitting in the audience and trying to wrap things up, but he was answering questions, and they were going on kind of long because people were all excited. And then somebody asked a question. I have no idea what it was. And he said, your question reminds me of a paper by James Geese in 1959. And then he described the paper very briefly. And I thought, oh, that sounds weird. That can't possibly be true, what he's saying. So 
I jotted down these 1959 um, on a scrap of paper, and then as usual, I threw that piece of paper on my desk and didn't find it for a couple of months, so I cleaned up my desk in the middle of the summer. And then I walked over, this is before the internet, I had to walk over to the library and find the paper. There are two 1959 newspapers, so I finally located the right one. Uh, and, um, and I thought it was really a cool paper, so I did, that fall, I designed a class, the first experiment in, in my most cited paper uh, is really, if I knew it was gonna be famous, I'd have done it better. Uh, it was a classroom demonstration experiment. And uh, I ran it myself, I scored it myself, I developed the materials myself, uh, didn't have a TA uh, for the course, and uh, experiment one in there is that classroom demonstration. And I remember giving the recognition test because I did it out loud. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, it was just a couple of lists, uh, six I think we used, I used in that experiment, and uh, I remember then after the whole thing was over, I said, I just want to ask you, look down at your sheet, uh, sleep, how many of you said sleep was in the list? And uh, the whole class practically raised their hand. Now I remember Larry Jacoby's son, Derek Jacoby, was in the class, and he raised his hand, and he was all happy, and uh, he, uh, I said, okay, all six of those words I just read you were not in the list. You're having a false memory for those. And they started talking and they couldn't believe it. And I started, got so I started taping the list so I could play it again to the class so they would know, no, I didn't make that up. It really wasn't there. Uh, but anyway, then Kathleen McGovern came in and, and we did a much better experiment too, which became kind of the, the standard paradigm. But that was a lot of fun. It started me off in a new direction. But again, it was just by accident. It was not. I know we should do programmatic research and everything should follow and you should have a theory and it just never has worked for me very well. Well, each of your new beginnings have, has become a programmatic line. Well, yeah, design. eventually, but, but it wasn't like I thought, gee, I should do this now. It was just kind of like I fell into it, it feels like. Serendipity or took an turning. opportunity that mm -hmm. presented itself, yeah. I guess would be the uh, better way of saying that. <laughs> so, um, so the, the false memory decade was in the late 90s decade, but since 2000, your work has become increasingly, can we say, applied. How did that happen? Um, I, uh, B.O. Skinner had a famous saying, what should you study? People would ask B.O. Skinner, what should I study? He says, find the most interesting thing you know of and study it. And so I started doing that. I went to Washington University. I got there. Uh, I'm now doing something called collective memory. I'm giving a talk on that in your symposium this afternoon. Uh, I had a new colleague named Jim Wirtz. When I came there, and people would ask me, well, what do you do? I'd say, well, I study human memory. Oh, we hired someone last year who does that. And I said, really? And they mentioned Jim Wirtz's name. And I knew his name with regard to Vygotsky. Uh, as being an explicator of Vygotsky and a scholar of Vygotsky, but I didn't realize he did collective memory work. And so I got to talking to him, and years later I started doing that kind of research with him. Then uh, I started doing work that was uh, on testing effect retrieval practice. Uh, Jeff Carpicki came to work with me at uh, Washington University, and he had some ideas. I said, well, those are fine ideas. He'd been at Indiana University. I said, but how about let's start doing this retrieval practice stuff. And I gave him a few papers to read. And then we started designing experiments. And I became very excited about that and about the practical implications of it. And so I, I'm still doing work on that, not as much as I used to. But um, that was very rewarding because it seemed to have more of a, a applications. We got several grants to take it into the schools. And then uh, Peter Brown and Mark McDaniel and I wrote a book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. And that's been very successful and I'm fielding questions from teachers and professors and doctors all the time about, oh, what should I be doing to teach fifth grade math or whatever it is. Uh, and so I make my best guess not having studied fifth grade math. But uh, so it was very rewarding and it just got to be those were the things 
I was interested in. I also started studying uh, eyewitness issues, um, both with the misinformation paradigm, but also eyewitness identification. And again, that was kind of an accident. Lynn Nadell asked me to write a chapter on confidence and memory, and I said, no, you know, you, you wrote the wrong person. I'm well known for never having done anything on this topic. Uh, and he said, that's why I'm asking you, because it's a very contentious field, and I want somebody to go in and try to sort it out. So Andrew DeSoto and John Wicks, I, I was on sabbatical in uh, La Jolla at UCSD, and John Wickstead, I, I talked him into uh, helping with the chapter, which he didn't want to do, and then it turned out to, he started reading all this stuff and it changed his research focus. Now he does mostly <laughs> eyewitness type stuff and not as much of his other, uh, but again, if Lynn Nadell hadn't asked me to write that chapter and I hadn't said yes, I thought, well, I'm going on sabbatical, I might as well learn something new. Uh, that's how that got started, so it was very rewarding too. And uh, the best thing I did in that area was get John Wickstead interested, and he's helped change the field there in two major ways uh, about how to do lineups and whether or not confidence really predicts accuracy. So what is it, what is it like to go into the classroom to do research? Because all the years I worked with you and have known your work since, it's all laboratory based. What, yeah, what well, like? uh, I wasn't literally in the classroom. We had research assistants who were. People asked me, why don't more you know, people studying human memory or human learning go into the classroom? And I can tell you why. It's really, really hard. It's hard to get the grants. You got to get the principal on board, the school board on board, the teachers on board. The students actually have to give informed consent. All the parents have to give informed consent. The students actually have to say, you can use their data. About 10% of them say, no, you can't. Uh, these are sixth graders, mind you. Uh, and so it's very difficult, but we did true experiments in the classroom. This was in collaboration with Kathleen McDermott and Mark McDaniel. We had three grants from the Institute of Education Sciences. And we, were, we had research assistants in the classroom most every day at uh, a school called Columbia Middle School in Columbia, Illinois. It was very rewarding, uh, but it was very difficult. I mean, it was just always something. Uh, and very hard, I mean, everything was completely counterbalanced. We did what you like to do in education research is assign classes to different treatments, uh, which is a problem. And then it was also a problem because the principal said, no, you can't do that uh, because I can't have parents coming in saying you're giving little Johnny something in this class, and little Susie's not getting it in that class, I'll have the parents mutiny, even if we don't know that it works. And so we had to design everything to be within students. And it's very unusual in education research to have a within student design where every student is, serves as his or her own control. Uh, so uh, it was very rewarding, but it was difficult. And right in the middle, I mean, every three years you're going in for new funding, and right in the middle when I had a great team going, research assistants, I'm the PI on this thing, and we missed the funding cutoff for that year, and so we lost all our research assistants. We had to go in the next year. We got it, but we lost momentum, so it took you know, another year to build back up with new research assistants and everything. So, uh, so it was great, but I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so then let me turn to a different topic. Uh, and here I have a sort of a two-part question for you, both having to do with um, editorship and journals. So at APS, you led the APS publications for several years, and you helped create three of their big journals uh, during that time. So the perspectives on psychological science, uh, clinical psychological science, and advances in methods and practices in psychological science, which we've rolled out just this year. So why did you see the need for these journals and sort of what, what's the story through all of that? Well, um, So that's the first part of my oh, question. Oh, that's the first part. Yes. Okay, it's a long part. Yes. Uh, the, um, 
I became, I, I, I was served on the APS Publications Committee for 19 years. I was chair for 12 of those years. I kept resigning as chair and being asked to come back by somebody, usually Alan Kraut, but one year it was Walter and Michelle after I had quit yet again. I have finally now quit for the last time after we got the editor of uh, the new Methods Journal, uh, Dan Simons, last spring. Uh, so um, it, APS journals, I think, have been tremendously successful. And part of the reason they have the idea that if you're a member of this society, you get every journal uh, either on paper or uh, uh, most people now are not opting for paper, but uh, in your inbox. So uh, we have 33,000 members. Every time you publish there, it goes potentially to 33,000 members. Most other societies have a subscription-based model. So like APA, you might be a member of APA, but then you have to pay extra to get their journals. And so if you publish a paper uh, in my well, edited the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, uh, that goes to however many people pay to have it subscribed to, and you can get it through your library if you're at a university. Um, but I think one reason the APS journals have been so successful is they're so widely broadcast. And so I get the clinical journal, I assume many of you do. Uh, it has a lot of memory stuff in it, actually. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder and memory and other topics. Uh, so um, the new journals we developed, I thought we should have, I actually, um, uh, didn't create as many journals as I wanted to. I thought we should go ahead. The, the original idea of APS journals was we would have journals that covered the whole field and uh, anything from industrial organizational psychology to sensation and perception and everything in between. And, um, and every journal would be of that character. We would not have specialized journals. I argued off and on over the years we should have specialized journals, which the first one we developed was the Clinical Psychology Journal. I don't know if they'll choose to do any more, but I think because of that model where your work goes to so many people, that made them very successful. And, um, and uh, the AMPS journals came in uh, response to the replication crisis, uh, as people call it, or replication opportunity, as some people call it. And the, um, so that was created then. Uh, perspectives was my idea of having a, a, a more theoretical journal, but um, that would be a mixture of articles, which I think has turned out to be very successful. Not empirical articles, but theoretical articles, opinion articles, review articles. Uh, and I think that journal has done uh, very well. And then... Um, so, yeah, I wanted the to clinical. then talk about your oh, okay. editorships oh. in this. So, uh, you, uh, were, you were the founding editor of Psycho Psychonomic Bulletin and Review, and you also served as editor-in-chief for Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition. So, the two heavy-duty uh, positions. Yeah, uh, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, I did in the 1980s. Rich Schiffman asked me to be associate editor he was overpowered by submissions. He was the only editor at that point. I think it was 1981 he asked me to come as associate editor, uh, and Alice Healy also. And so when I said yes, he delivered up to my office uh, six manuscripts complete with reviews. And so I was supposed to act on these, uh, even though I hadn't assigned reviewers and I'd never written an action letter in my life. So I look at the stack, and I decided to do the oldest one first. The oldest one was a submission from Donald Broadbent, the most eminent uh, British psychologist of the time, and a man I really revered. I just thought he was a wonderful person and a great psychologist. It got three negative reviews. So my, my first job was to write Donald Broadbent a rejection letter. I thought, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this. This line of work, but anyway, I got through that. He wrote me a very, being Donald Broadbent, he wrote me a very gracious reply, thanking me for my note. I was just uh, uh, gratified to receive that. Um, and then, so I did that for three years, and then became the editor after Schiffrin. 
And that was, uh, I learned so much in those five years. I had asked Angel told me, should I do it? I was kind of young to do this. I was like 35 when they asked me to be editor. And I thought, you know, I might take away. But, uh, and he, he, he advised me to do it. Um, somebody else had already turned it down. I was second choice in that case. Uh, Marsha Johnson had been asked and turned it down. And, um, and I was thinking, maybe Marsha knows something I don't know. Uh, but Hiddle said, no, you, you'll want to do it. He says, you'll learn a lot about the field, but you'll learn so much about human nature. He says, you just won't believe the stuff that'll happen to you. And that's true. People who complain and protest, other people like Donald Broadbent, who writes you thank you letters for your rejection letter. So you just learn so much about people. But I also learned, you know, when, you, when you're an editor, so here's a paper, you might not know much about the topic, but you read it. And then you read what three really smart people think about it. And so your critical thinking skills uh, and, and your knowledge of the field, even, even a paper that's rejected, well, you learned a lot from learning about the topic and the review. Uh, so even if you wind up rejecting it, I used to joke, I know much more about the, the world of cognitive psychology that didn't get published than I do about what did get published, because I didn't have much time to read other journals at that point. So became very, unfam very familiar with the unpublished literature in cognitive psychology. <laughs> so um, we began with uh, your early family life. So what I want to do now is to ask you uh, two, again, a twofold question, okay. if you will. Um, first about your family family, so professional and personal life synergy and then about your academic family. Uh, so let's do the family, family part first. Family, family, okay. Well, I'm, I've been married to Kathleen McDermott for the last 12 years, uh, quite happily. I asked her, could I say quite happily? She said, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, that's been great. We're on sabbatical right now uh, down the road in Carmel, California, so that's been great. Uh, I have two children. Um, uh, Kurt, my son, uh, went to Brown University and then majored in the lucrative field of acting, and so he's been living in New York, uh, acting some, but mostly waiting tables, is the way that works out. Uh, and, uh, but he's doing, uh, doing fine in New York. And my daughter, Rebecca, became, uh, she went to Stanford and then became, uh, went to Cornell Medical School in New York, so for a while my kids were in the same city. And then she did a residency there, and she got married a year ago and has now moved to St. Louis. Her, uh, her husband's a resident in psychiatry, and she's a fellow in gastroenterology. So they're doing well. And your academic family. My uh, academic you, family, so okay. Is, is the, so I, want to, I want to frame that with the with a reminder that a, uh, Roddy is the winner of the APS Mentorship Award. Uh, and uh, which you received a few years back. And so tell us about your idea of mentoring students. I know a little bit about it. Uh, and uh, so I was hoping you would sort of elaborate on that and how you saw that whole experience, how you continue to see that experience and what it means to you. Well, it's been great. I, um, I think I've had great students my whole career Purdue, Rice, Washington University. Obviously, uh, when I was at Toronto, I was hanging around, but I didn't have my own students because I was just a visitor. Uh, but um, it's been very rewarding. It really is like having an academic family. And um, I don't know, people ask me about mentorship style. I, I, I you'd almost, you'd be in a better position to say than I would. So I, can, I can say, uh, oh, okay. I can say something <laughs> here that might. You can answer that, that might, question. No, I, uh, yeah, I, actually I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to hear your okay. answer. But let me say a few things. You know, one of the things that I noticed when I was in your lab and then since then, as I've noticed, uh, one of the, Something that I, I try to remember now as, um, as a faculty advisor myself, uh, you were very quick to figure out which one of us wanted or needed more uh, involvement from you and which one of us just wanted to be left alone. Um, okay, uh, probably that's true. The, um, 
I mean, I, I, we have a, in my lab, we have a lab meeting every week. Uh, that's where I think most of graduate education happens is in lab meetings, not in formal classes, because you learn to think things through. And we did that when I was at Yale and in Toronto, and that was what I imprinted on. Uh, and you read papers, you discuss new problems, you uh, discuss it whenever anybody has a dissertation proposal. I haven't discussed it with the whole group to get a group opinion before your committee sees it. Uh, and usually when people start out, I try to give them a project I think that will work. Often they show up and they have an idea of what they want to do because from their undergraduate and sometimes I think, well, that's okay. Other times I think this isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, and so I always try to start people off at least on one thing I think will really get them a publication from research done in their first year. And I think that's very important so they don't flounder around. Um, everybody talks about how important the dissertation is. Well, dissertation's late in your career. What really matters for when you're finishing is what you do your first couple of years. And uh, I'm a little more directed there, but usually if things work out, I'll direct people and then they catch fire and then they come in with lots of their own ideas and then it's much more like a collaboration than it is at first. But you're right, some students um, come in kind of more prepared than others depending on their experience. If you uh, come from, like I did, came from a small liberal arts college uh, and I knew some things, but um, you know I needed a whole lot of training. Uh, and others come in with more training and better prepared. So it just depends on, on the student. And I don't have meetings with my students every week. I say, here we start a project, and I don't ask for weekly updates or anything like that. It's just, uh, you know, in your life, you're not going to have people looking over your shoulder saying, hey, where is it? Uh, and so I tend not to do that, but and I watch people, how they progress. Some people are very speedy, others are much slower. You know how that goes. But uh, you, uh, your uh, supervision uh, is not quite the right word, but your mentorship doesn't really end when students leave your lab. And that's part of why we are sitting here uh, having this conversation. So uh, how has that been a part of your um, engagement with students that, you know, I, I, I call you whenever I have a question. Yeah, well, uh, I'm open to that. Not everybody does, but uh, uh, not all my students uh, ask, but, but they often do. Uh, and I think that's good, as I say, I'm still uh, talking to Lil Hulving every once in a while. He's be 91 later this month um, and still going pretty strong. Uh, the um, uh, so I'm there if people need me. I remember one time introducing you to somebody uh, and I said, this is Saparna Rajaram. She used to be uh, uh, her, my student. I, I used to be her mentor. She said, no, no, you don't get off that easy. You still are. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, so yeah, no, that, that's fine. Uh, but it's been, I think, Graduate students are really uh, one of the most rewarding things. I think one of the great things about being a college professor, uh, because I have all these friends who knew me growing up, and, oh, you know, why did you want to do that? Well, it's just to me, um, both undergraduate and graduate, I get older every year. The students stay the same age. They're eager. They want to learn. Uh, they're uh, just always uh, a joy to have around. I, I taught a seminar last year to undergraduates. Jim Merchant and I taught uh, um, a seminar on collective memory. I thought it was one of the best teaching experiences I had in my whole life. I mean, it was just so much fun. And so, uh, and we were kind of making it up as we went along because neither one of us had taught the course before. But that's why academia is so fun that if there's something I want to know about that I don't know anything about, I'll teach a course on it because then I'm forced to read all this stuff that I wouldn't be reading. If you just say, oh, I need to learn about that, well, you'll never do it. But if you have to do it because the students are reading it and you have to show up tomorrow and uh, be one step ahead of them, you hope, then you know, that's the way to get get something you learned just to teach a course in it, which sounds odd. 
teaching a course you don't know anything about, but but that is how you, I mean, it's not that you don't know anything, but. So Roddy, as your student on this topic of mentorship, I want to thank you uh, for having this conversation with me and with everyone here and all the students and um, rising scientists who will watch this video and learn from the story of your life and the way every turn you changed what might have been a challenge into an opportunity and, and why, uh, you know, people can learn why you have the success and, and the contributions that you have made. Thank you so much. Thank you.